The Great Pyramid is a challenge to our intellects and ways of thinking simply by existing. His planners encoded a massive number of mathematical concepts in his design, placement, and execution, and there are a host of fascinating facts about it that most people are unaware of. For those interested in details of the inner structures and designs of the pyramids, I have left links in the description below. Herodotus told us that the Egyptian priest claimed the Great Pyramid took 20 years to complete, but to do this, a block would have to have been quarried, transported, dressed, lifted, and mortared into place with exactitude every five minutes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to fit within that time frame, an improbable feat. In this third part of the Ancient Architecture series, we will be looking at the three most notable structures of the Giza Plateau, the pyramids, as representative of our hypothesis that they belong in a subcategory of monuments that are at great remove, both stylistically and from an engineering and construction standpoint, from the architectural creations of dynastic Egyptian civilization. The Great Pyramid is attributed by conventional thought to the pharaoh Khufu, supposedly constructed as his tomb circa 2590 BCE. It is 458 feet high and incorporates over 2.3 million blocks of stone, ranging in size from 3 to 200 tons. One of the more notable yet puzzling exterior features is the indentation up each side, essentially making it an eight-sided structure. Note the shadow line just to the left of the blue markers. The purpose of this feature is a complete mystery, but weaving it into the fabric of construction would have been a huge challenge. Another mysterious feature is the original entrance portal located in the north face, the location of which was concealed in the masonry plan by the builders and then forgotten in antiquity. Supposedly designed to open to those who knew the secrets of the mechanism, it has fallen into a state of disrepair so severe that no one can even guess how it originally operated. There are a small number of original casing stones on the north and south faces at ground level, and the ones on the north exhibiting a good condition, but those in the south are extremely eroded. The gaps between the joints are approximately the width of a human hair. The remaining paving stones around the perimeter that survived exhibit the same polygonal jigsaw puzzle pattern seen in the walls and flooring of the Valley Temple. Here my co-producer Joe lends himself for scale at the northeast corner of the pyramid where some portions of the lower courses employ very large ashlars. On the eastern side, the pavement shows the sockets and placeholders of some long-vanished collection of artifacts, thought by some to have been statues. Here we see the signs of extremely precise inlay work, almost playfully and casually placed, as if an afterthought. Continuing along the perimeter to the south face, we see that both the core masonry and the remaining casing blocks exhibit the signs of severe weathering, much more advanced than on the north face. Most of the pavement here is missing and the foundation blocks are exposed. Moving to the western face, we see that the majority of the paving is missing here as well, revealing the slope of the foundation platform, which must have been meant to collect and divert rainwater, although this area has not seen significant rainfall for 6,000 years, according to paleoclimatologists. In the north face, a few courses above ground level, is a rough hole gouged into the core masonry, known as Al-Mamun's Hole, created by a caliph in 820 AD searching for treasure. One enters the pyramid here to gain access to the ascending passage, a shaft incorporated into the core masonry, one meter square, that runs upward at an angle of 26 degrees for a distance of 39 meters. No other access to the interior of the pyramid has ever been found. It is indeed difficult to conceive of a funerary procession consisting of great goods, slaves, mourners, furniture, priests, sarcophagi, and all the accoutrements of a royal internment being forced to ascend up this steep 
slippery, and extremely cramped shaft. Emerging from the passage, one enters a platform with an aidant leading forward to the Queen's Chamber, which was barred during our last two visits, a great disappointment as it contains many interesting features that are thought-provoking, not the least of which are the two inclined shafts heading upwards to blocks with metal bosses on them, discovered by Gantenbrink in 1993. The sensationalist but unfortunately inaccurate media coverage of this event insisted on referring to these blocks as doors, although they are only eight inches wide and tall. A sloping corridor leads, again at an angle of 26 degrees, upwards from that platform in front of the Queen's Chamber to the landing in front of the King's Chamber through a very long, very narrow, and very tall and imposing feature called the Grand Gallery. The corbelled masonry work of this construction is massive and exact. At regularly spaced intervals along both sides of this gallery, there are deep stone sockets, 28 in number, whose purpose is unknown and a source of much speculation. At the top of the gallery, one is greeted with yet another one-meter square passage, leading through an intermediate portcullis chamber and debouching into the king's chamber. It is interesting to note that the entrance to the connecting shaft has a very peculiar appearance, almost as though the limestone has been partially melted by heat or acid, and this feature retains a very glossy, smooth, almost glass-like surface texture. The king's chamber itself is a very stark construction, featuring rose granite blocks for floor, walls, and ceiling, featureless and empty except for the opposing air shafts on the north and south walls and the granite box to one side. Any sound produced inside the chamber is amplified and echoed until the sound levels become significantly elevated. The granite box, also of rose granite, is lidless and has suffered sad depredation over the hundreds of years since the pyramid was breached, with guides and tourists alike banging on it with stones to dislodge souvenir pieces to take home. The idea that it is a burial coffer is somewhat laughable, since no pharaoh would ever have permitted his mummy to be interred in such a small, cramped, undecorated and plain box with no magic inscriptions to guide him through the afterlife. Obviously, it had some other purpose. Some have speculated that purpose was as another mental challenge, since it has been discovered that a number of very clever mathematical tricks are embedded in its form. The volume of the interior cavity is exactly equal to the volume of the box itself, for instance. Also, the proportions exhibit the concept of phi, or the golden section, as does the chamber it resides in, and other geometries and integers are incorporated as well. I have put a link in the description to articles on this. Another extremely puzzling aspect of it is that one end is very slightly concave and the opposite end is slightly but equally convex. The northern air shaft remains open, but the southern air shaft has had a fan installed in it by Gantenbrink to provide air circulation, which has become necessary to combat the negative effects of the humid exhalations of hundreds of thousands of tourists every year. Departing the King's Chamber, we travel back down the Grand Gallery, navigate the claustrophobic ascending passage, and then reverse our direction to enter the descending passage, yet another constrictive one meter square shaft of 26 degrees inclination, to the lowest level of the pyramid known as the Subterranean Chamber or Pit. Flinders Petrie found this shaft to be absolutely straight and even within one quarter of an inch from the top to the bottom. The upper portion is incorporated into the core masonry, but the lower section is carved from the bedrock of the plateau. This pit continues to be a source of speculation. Academia insists it was originally intended to be the resting place of the pharaoh, but the architects changed their minds and abandoned it half-finished. I regard this as half-baked thinking. Other theories involve subsonic sound generation, hydraulic pumps, or a connection to the afterworld. It is a very unnerving place, impossible to be comfortable in, 
and quirky acoustic properties allow one to clearly hear conversations being held far above in the king's chamber. The walls and ceiling are roughed out to the same general level of craftsmanship as the rest of the pyramid's internal features, but the floor is uneven, sculpted in a series of steps and a set of giant fins of rock all carved from the native bedrock. Treasure hunters long ago delved a shaft in one wall and a pit into the floor to no avail. Returning up the descending shaft is not an exercise for the elderly or weak, and one is glad to stand outside again with the climb over. Exiting Al Mumun's hall, we clamber down the first few courses of exterior masonry and head for the east side of the pyramid, where a very special but often overlooked feature awaits us, the basalt platform. This large expanse of fine-grained basalt blocks has several intriguing characteristics worthy of study. Here there are a large number of tumbled and overturned blocks around the perimeter that exhibit saw cuts, core drill holes, and split faces from the quartering and dressing efforts performed on them. On the top of the platform, one can see that the recurring theme of polygonal jigsaw puzzle placement is present, and although we were not allowed to carry our laser levels onto the plateau, the surface appears dead flat across the entire extent of it. It seems significant to us that the method of installing a platform mirrors the technique applied to the granite casing of the Valley Temple. That is, the bottom sides of the blocks have been cut and worked to fit the unevenness of the underlying limestone surface, and yet the end result is an absolutely plumb and level top surface, a feat of careful craftsmanship that must surely have been a prodigious task. Moving around the perimeter, we find several basalt blocks and broken fragments that bear witness to the tools that crafted them. Some speculate that this was done with bronze drag saws and sand with water for lubrication, but I reject this notion due to four observations. One, the drag saws would have had to be so thin that binding and work hardening and breakage would have been debilitating according to the kerfwitz that we documented not to mention the extremely slow progress of this cutting method through basalt, a very hard igneous material, since the sand of the plateau is of a lesser hardness than the basalt. Two, the cut lines left on the curved sides are too regular and contiguous in spacing and too laterally uniform to have been produced by a hand-drawn motion, which would introduce a noticeable variations in depth and stroke. Three, all the curves examined exhibit a bottom profile that is rounded and very close to a radius equal to one half the thickness of the cutting blade. And four, I located one specimen where there is a cut mark at a tangent angle to the adjoining cut surface, which was started in the center of the block face rather than progressing from the top down through the block. This cannot be done with a drag saw or indeed any kind of linear cutting tool. Only wire saws and circular saws can accomplish this feat. The conventional attribution of the platform is that it was the floor of a mortuary temple where the body of the deceased Pharaoh Khufu would have been prepared for internment. I find it noteworthy that none of the walls of this supposed structure have survived, and also that there is no sign of internal roof support columns as we see in the Valley Temple. The second largest pyramid on the plateau is attributed to Khafre, circa 2550 before the Common Era, supposedly the pharaoh that also commissioned the Sphinx and the Sphinx and Valley. Situated on a higher portion of the plateau than the Great Pyramid, it is always the focus of photographs and videos of the plateau, and many mistakenly assume that it is indeed the Great Pyramid they are seeing, due to the appearance of greater height. It is, in fact, 10 feet shorter in height than the Great Pyramid at 448 feet. It retains a small proportion of its original casing stones near the peak, the rest having been shaken loose by the great earthquake of 1303 A.D. and quarried, carried off to build mosques and palaces in Cairo, as was also the fate of the Great Pyramid's casing stones. Here we see the view from halfway up the causeway, that connects the Valley Temple to the Mortuary Temple of Khafre. 
The original paving is long gone, but a few solitary blocks remain. The remains of the mortuary temple are in significant disrepair, exhibiting an extreme degree of erosion by wind and sand, as opposed to the water weathering seen in the Sphinx Trench. This absence of water weathering could indicate that the mortuary temple was erected much later than the valley temple or the pyramid. At the southwest corner of Khafre's pyramid, we see very large foundation blocks that were laid to provide support on the slope of the plateau, while on the northeast corner, the bedrock had to be cut away to achieve the same level. The perimeter paving exhibits the same fine detail and interlocking polygonal design as that surrounding the Great Pyramid. The ashlars used for the lower courses of the pyramid are very large blocks, almost the size of those in the core of the valley temple, while the upper courses are formed of slightly smaller blocks than those in the Great Pyramid. The remaining casing stones at the base are very weathered, but exhibit the same incredible craftsmanship of those in the Great Pyramid. The entrance to the pyramid was closed during our visits in 2007, 2017, and 2021. The third largest pyramid on the plateau, attributed to the pharaoh Menkare, circa 2500 BCE, rises 213 feet, half the height of the other two pyramids. It was also closed during all three of our visits to Egypt. Although the core masonry is limestone, the casing stones are of red granite from Aswan, shaped and laid in a most peculiar fashion. Instead of the regular bond-type pattern of casing stones exhibited by on the other two pyramids, Binkare's pyramid displays a markedly polygonal, semi-random arrangement of each course, and a feature common to megalithic construction in Central and South America, sometimes termed nubs, is common to these stones, the purpose of which is a mystery with many speculative interpretations. Curiously, the outer portion of the casing stones are shaped with very large gaps between them and a strange pillowed outer appearance, but in the smoothed portion surrounding the entrance, we see that the blocks are actually remarkably tight-fitting, further inwards from their outer faces, a puzzling technique with no apparent functional purpose, although complicating the construction significantly. The first 15 courses were fashioned in this manner, with the remaining upper courses made of flat and polished Tura limestone. In 1196 AD, there was an attempt by the reigning sultan to dismantle the pyramids, starting with that of Menkare, but after nearly a year of labor, the project was halted. Despite their efforts, workmen were only able to damage the pyramid to the extent of leaving a large vertical gash in its northern face. In the fourth video of this series, we will be visiting the pyramids at Dashur and Saqqara to compare their design and construction and exploring the interior of the Red Pyramid.